Hey home bakers, we've all seen videos about stone baking sourdough loaves to perfection, baking bread in a Dutch oven, but nobody ever talks about baking bread on a tray, which I believe is probably the trickiest of them all. Roll that feed tune. Hello to you and welcome back to the Bake With Jack YouTube channel where I make videos to help you make amazing bread for the rest of your life. If you are new here and you'd like to stick around, consider clicking subscribe if you get some value out of this video or the previous 174, however many videos there are before this one. And if you really wanna to go to town, sign up in the link in the description for your free Home Bakers Bulletin email delivered to your inbox every single week with all of my content from the week. Baking bread on a tray might seem like the simplest way, and it's most likely the first place you'll start because you don't need any special equipment to be able to make it happen. All you need is a tray and an oven and a bowl and a Bake With Jack dough scraper available to purchase from bakewithjack.co.uk forward slash shop. But realistically, it's not the simplest way. You are actually more at risk of blowing out the underside of your loaf of bread or your rolls. And without the safety of a hot stone, pretty much guaranteeing the oven spring, Things might come out a little bit skew with, roughly translated wonky. So I'm gonna make some trade loaves, a couple of bloomers, although the principle applies to anything you bake on a tray, whether it's a cob or a batch of rolls. I'm gonna show you the nine points of the process we need to pay close attention to to make sure everything comes out just Hopefully then it will, and then we'll look at the final project, searching for clues to see what we did well and what we could have done better. I hope all that made sense. Cut to the table. The dough I'm making here is pretty straightforward. I'm kneading it well with zero flour, which could be the beginning of your tray baking success strategy. But we've spoken about this a lot on this channel. If you already know, you already know. And if you don't already know, check out video number 89, a whole dedicated video to just not kneading with flour. But probably the most important thing to note here is that the hydration is low-ish. I'm talking about 62 to 65% hydration because a wetter dough will be looser and flow out while the dough rests on a tray later. If you are having trouble with flat loaves that kind of flow out sideways, the first thing to try is to reduce the moisture in the recipe. Use less water, making a tighter dough. I'm gonna use this dough to make two freestanding bloomers because the shaping is simple, exactly the same as a tinned loaf that you've all seen countless times here on the Baker Jack YouTube channel. And also, so then I can show you something really important later on before we bake them. This is the first important part to note. We are shaping up bloomers, right? They're gonna be free standing on a tray, okay? No tin sides to make sure they only rise up. And so, once again, if you know, you know, we're gonna pre-shape these into balls first. This begins the foundations of structure building within our loaf to ensure best chance of a nice shape in the final loaf as it proves up. Structure is one of our all important principles of bread making. We must build structure in our dough in order for it to hold a nice shape while it puffs up, especially when we are proving and baking on a tray like today. We do this with deliberate folds, creating tension across the top always. It astounds me just how many bread making recipes do not have a pre-shaped stage because that's exactly what a baker does in a bakery. A baker divides the big massive dough up into pieces and then rolls each up into a ball doing the pre-shape and then shapes them all one by one after that. Even if I'm just making a single loaf at home, I would always do a pre-shape before the final shape. So the pre-shape sits for 10 to 15 minutes to rest and relax and then the final shape. If I flip it over, press it, stretch the edges out, fold them in, fold the top part down, and then roll push, roll push, roll push, all the way to the end, we build great structure. Again, we are shooting for tension here on the outside of the loaf, making it tight, but not pushing it past its point of natural resistance, therefore ripping the outside and making it sticky. The seam is tucked away underneath and hidden out of sight. I'm gonna do it a second time. This time we do an ASMR version for those of you who wanna see it slowly, properly. I'm well aware we've done it tons of times on this channel. If you're already sick of it, I've left timestamps underneath so you can just skip it.
Line your tray with parchment paper and place your loaves down as far apart as you can. Because remember, they're gonna puff up nicely and they might stick together if you put them too close. Don't stress out too much about this part. If later down the line you realize they're too close together, we can fix that and I'll show you exactly how we do that later on. Score your loaves with a serrated knife now because that allows it to puff up to its full potential by increasing the surface area. Confine your cuts to the inside part of the loaf for the best shape because the more and bigger your cuts are, the more your loaf will spread. If you carve a deep lattice, for example, a crisscross over the whole thing, you, the structure is gonna be weak on the outside and it's just gonna spread and flow out wide. This next part is important, the puff. Avoid drafts at all costs while your dough is puffing up. If there is a slight draft over the top of your dough, the outside will dry out and form a skin. Underneath will still be moist, possibly stuck to the paper. When it comes to bake, there's a massive risk of your loaf bursting open there because thanks to the dry skin on the outside, that part where the dough meets tray is the most fragile. And that's where, if anywhere, your loaf is likely to burst open. We'll take a look at this part when we show the final loaf and see how we got on. If you are worried, cover your dough with something airtight, like double layered dusted with flour cling film, or I use these plastic boxes here in the studio that I pack all of my class stuff in. Prove your dough up to its full potential until it's really puffy and quite delicate. We spoke about this bit in great depth recently in video 173. I think it was about building your home baker's instincts or something like that. I'll leave the link in the description so you can watch it after this. Here's what I was talking about earlier. My loaves have puffed up now and there's still quite a gap in between, but they could potentially be further away from each other. There are two things that could happen here. Firstly, as they bake, they are going to jump. They're gonna increase in volume. And the worst thing that can happen is they're both joined together in the middle and create these kind of conjoined twin loaves, what nobody wants. Secondly, even if they didn't touch, the bread is gonna be making its own steam here. Steam is gonna be escaping naturally from the loaves as they bake. It will build up in this bit in between where the loaves are closest to each other, making that part in between those inner surfaces, if you like, the weakest part, and if they are to erupt somewhere, they will go where the dough is weakest, in between there where the moisture has built up. If they have got close while they have puffed, don't try to move them because they are fragile now and will probably collapse. Instead, cut the paper with a knife or some scissors down the middle and slide them away from each other. Now in your preheated oven, bake your loaf to whatever the instructions say in the recipe. And if it doesn't say use steam, always, you steam. I do this with a hot preheated tray in the bottom of the oven and a kettle of boiling water. Load the bread, pour the water carefully underneath in that tray and close the door. Steam will keep the outside of your loaf softer for longer and then it will evenly rise. Without it, the outside will dry. The top surface will dry and form a crust and then once again, that part underneath where dough meets tray will be the weakest and if anywhere, it will burst there. <laughs> When they are done, get them off onto a cooling rack, keeping the paper for next time. If you leave them on the tray to cool, they will steam up underneath and get all wet and soggy and gross. Let's take a look at how we got on. Well, here they are, and as much as I'd like to show you two immaculately perfect loaves, as if it were unattainable by any mere mortal other than the mighty Bake With Jack, uh, that's not actually the case. We've got a nice shape here on both of these loaves. Now the sun's coming out. What? <laughs> I thought it was winter. I thought the sun was going down. One sec. We've got nice shape overall. Nice dome shape on these and nice markings on the top. Um, but we did, look, we did get a break underneath on the edge. And I know exactly why that happened. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you why. A loaf will always burst where it's weakest. We know that if it is to burst at all. In this case, and with all tray baked breads, whether they're rolls or bloomers or cob loaves or whatever, there is always an area of excess moisture between the tray and the bread itself. That's why stone baking is such a powerful thing. You saw those two loaves on the tray when they're fully proved up, didn't you? This 
has happened because of my worry. Because here at Bakewood Jack Studios, I'm making a video to give you the best chance of getting the best results possible. Those loaves were looking pretty flat earlier on the tray before I baked them, weren't they? And it was my worry of the final product that made me abandon my instincts and put the loaves in the oven a little bit early just in case they spread any further. This burst, in the way that it's happened, in the size of the burst, in fact, this is probably the worst one to show you, here and here, is because I hadn't proved it up for long enough. It's just the loaf's way of telling me that I could have proved it up a little bit further. There was a little bit extra pressure left inside of that that busted it up at the edge. And if it's gonna bust anywhere on a trade bread, it's gonna be on that edge. But hey, theoretically, if I let these prove up to the point of perfection, they would have inflated nicely doing the oven spring in the oven without that additional pressure to bust open the sides. But hey, we've got a nice color, we've got a nice shape. We got a nice crust and that just goes to show that baking on a tray is trickier than a lot of people think, especially trickier than stone baking your loaf. It's worth noting though, in a Jerry Springer final thought kind of way that this loaf is a great success and I never get hung up on these inconsistencies. If it is important to you and the craft of the final points of loaf perfection is your passion, I hope these points helped you out. Just promise me one thing, don't let it get you down. Feel no fear of the underside busted bloomer. Do not let that get in the way of simply trying. Keep cracking out homemade bread for yourself, for your friends, for your family, for your neighbors. With their own beautiful imperfections, enjoy the process, enjoy the product, and celebrate it simply because you made it. I hope this helped. See ya. And there it is, I hope you learned loads about the often overlooked techniques of baking, as simple as it sounds, on a tray. Thank you so much for being here. If you don't forget, you can get all my content from the week if you sign up for your home baker's bulletin and email delivered straight to your inbox every single week for free. The link is in the description. See ya.